so thanks so much for the invitation to um, be here. I'm excited to um, think and learn about these things with you all. Um, the the non-human animals part of this is not something I've written about. So I appreciate the invitation also as sort of a spur to thinking about that. Um, and it's all correspondingly uh, tentative. So uh, I'm, yeah, I'm looking forward to the discussion and, and um, mean more to sort of frame some questions than uh, to really answer them. Um, my plan is basically to do two things. So first, I'm going to give you sort of a, a relatively short and, and somewhat opinionated sketch of uh, contemporary uh, views, uh, disagreements about the concept of discrimination and relatedly sort of the, the normative uh, accounts of the wrongfulness of wrongful discrimination. And then, uh, as I said a moment ago, I'm going to sort of pose some questions and potential challenges for applying that kind of body of thought to the situation of non-human animals. Um, on the concept of discrimination, uh, there are a few distinctions I think it's helpful to mark. So, so one is between moralized and non-moralized um, conceptions of this concept. So this is, I think, reasonably intuitive. But uh, sometimes when people call something uh, discrimination or discriminatory, they are um, uh, ipso facto uh, condemning it, right? That's uh, nobody wants to be accused of discrimination. Other times, uh, the, the concept has no moral status built into it. And so we can ask you know, whether a particular instance of discrimination is wrongful discrimination or not. And people um, uh, have articulated accounts of discrimination uh, uh, of each of these kinds. The way I've tended to write about it and think about it is of the non-moralized kind. I don't think there's sort of a knockdown argument for that, but I think as a matter of um, theoretical utility, it's helpful to be able to distinguish the question, what makes something the, the kind of act type that we're talking about in the first place from the question, uh, when and why are instances of that act type wrong? And you can't do that very well if you don't have a non-moralized version of the uh, concept. But the key thing I think is just to be clear about whether um, uh, discrimination is being used uh, in a moralized sense or not. There's a related distinction um, um, uh, about the role that the law does or should play in thinking about discrimination. So I think one uh, intuitive view, and this is the perspective from which I've uh, mostly written about discrimination, is sort of non-legalized. So, that, so the, you know, there are interesting questions about discrimination law, to be sure, but uh, there are also independent questions about um, uh, this category of conduct as a, uh, a moral well, I guess most fundamentally a category in the philosophy of action, like what is it to discriminate? And then a moral category and when and why are acts of that kind uh, morally objectionable? Uh, and then, you know, the law tracks or doesn't track those to different degrees. And maybe the law can be criticized insofar as it fails to track what is actually morally wrongful discrimination. Maybe the ways in which the law conceives of discrimination differently than uh, or ordinary morality does can actually be justified for reasons that are particular to the law. Um, but, but fundamentally, th these are two different things. There's another way of thinking about it, which, which I also have some sympathy for, that, um, that that's a little bit artificial and naive, that, that you know, the law is so central to um, how we think about discrimination at this point in uh, our social history, that the idea of sort of consulting one's moral intuitions about what is and isn't discriminatory and imagining that that's a completely separate enterprise than um, uh, the, uh, that that's not in some way parasitic on or infected by um, a set of uh, legal practices that constitute the anti-discrimination project in um, uh, many societies, that maybe that's problematic and that actually uh, an inquiry into, into discrimination has to be uh, to some extent, an inquiry into a, a legal category as well as sort of a more basic moral one. I think that's an important distinction, but as I said, sort of my, uh, I've taken this, what I think is the simpler view, which is uh, that the law is one thing and what is wrongful discrimination for moral purposes is a different question. Um, and then 
there is a, a more general sort of distinction in how broadly or narrowly you conceive of this concept, obviously. So I'll give you some examples of axes of disagreement about that. One is whether social salience is essential to the concept of discrimination. So some have defended the view that uh, uh, for something to be uh, an instance of discrimination, even in the non-moralized sense, it has to at least be a kind of differentiation with respect to um, some socially salient dimension of identity, right? That uh, race, gender, and you know, indefinitely many other potential uh, things, but not just anything at all. Um, whereas uh, the concept, uh, the conception analysis that I've articulated, which I'll give you in a minute, um, doesn't build in a social salience requirement. So you can speak of uh, discriminating on the basis of eye color or anything else. And uh, I think that's a good way to go uh, for sort of like what I said about the moralized and non-moralized versions um, in that it allows you to ask and not obscure the question of what different social salience does in fact make and why. Um, uh, it seems clearly right that discrimination on the basis of socially salient axes of identity is importantly different than discrimination that isn't, um, but we should have an account of why that's so, rather than just building that into what we mean by discrimination in the first place, I think. Uh, and then finally, uh, a conception of discrimination can be uh, more or less focused on kind of the central case or what is intuitively to many people, the central case of uh, discrimination, or it can uh, encompass um, uh, extensions of different kinds. So there are, you know, as you all know, these various prefixed notions of discrimination, indirect discrimination, structural discrimination. And there's a choice about whether to think of those as um, instances of discrimination that therefore a concept, a conceptual analysis of discrimination ought to explain and accommodate, or to think of them as uh, non, you know, sort of, um, uh, they're prefixed because they aren't quite discrimination. There's something importantly related to it, but something that's different. And so uh, uh, a conceptual analysis, at least initially, shouldn't kind of stretch to try to incorporate all of them. Okay, so those are sort of orienting axes along which you could think about where a conceptual analysis falls. The account of uh, discrimination that I have offered um, is non-moralized. And in that last respect I was just talking about, about sort of how many extensions it tries to accommodate, it's, it's narrow and treats some of the things that are sometimes described as indirect discrimination or the like as other uh, things, which I'll talk about in a minute and which I think might be a useful analogy for some of the questions about um, animals. But let me just give you the thrust of this conceptual analysis. So. Um, uh, the idea is that somebody X discriminates against Y in some dimension, W, on the basis of some trait, P, and then there are two conditions. Um, I'll just do them one at a time. One is uh, differential treatment. So X has to treat Y less favorably in that dimension than they treat somebody else, although that somebody else could be a counterfactual somebody else, but there has to be a difference how this person is treated and how someone else is or would be treated in the same dimension. And this is maybe the key condition, that difference has to be explained, that difference in treatment has to be explained by a difference in how the discriminator regards uh, the two, uh, I was gonna say people, but we could think more broadly about, uh, you know, discriminate uh, yeah, how they are regarded in respect of the trait P. Right? That has to figure in the explanation of the differential treatment. So the point of that explanatory condition um, is to uh, is to be it's broad in one sense. Um, it's not limited to sort of intentional, um, uh, invidious, you know, hostile discrimination. So a case of implicit bias, for example, would satisfy that because plausibly, um, in a in a case where somebody's acting out of let's say an implicit racial bias a difference in how they regard the different people racially or in terms of race um, figures in explaining, figures in the explanation of the differential treatment. Um, but it, it's narrow in that it doesn't extend to sort of upstream uh, 
uh, causal pathways that contribute to the explanation. So here's a, a hypothetical that I've used uh, to explain this, that um, if you imagine like an amusement park that has rides for kids to go on and there's a height requirement for one of the rides that's you have to be four feet to go on this ride for it to be safe. Um, and there's an eight-year-old child who doesn't meet the height requirement and they're turned away by the operator of this ride. And on, on this account, that's clearly height discrimination. That's easy, right? You can plug in height for P and that obviously will come out. But it's not age discrimination, even though it's true that the child's age plausibly explains their being, certainly contributes to the explanation of their being turned away because plausibly, it's their age that explains their being under four feet tall, and that explains their being turned away. It doesn't qualify as discrimination on the basis of age, according to this definition, because it's not a difference in how that person is regarded in terms of age versus somebody else uh, that explains the uh, actor's decision, right? The actor is completely indifferent to um, uh, consciously, unconsciously, and otherwise completely indifferent to age, they're responding to a difference in height. And according to this definition of discrimination, discrimination is when you're responding to a difference in respect of some trait. Uh, um, that, that's kind of the essence of the concept. That's what in some legal contexts is called direct discrimination. Um, uh, and I'm positing that um, it kind of is just the core conceptual analysis of um, discrimination in sort of its ordinary sense. So that doesn't extend to at least some cases of what people call indirect discrimination. Um, uh, so I want to say a little bit about that and how to think about that. The first point to say, though, is that there are some things that people call indirect discrimination that do fit that definition perfectly well. So one of those is uh, cases of pretext. So uh, you know, if the US government bans immigrants from certain countries and says it's uh, because of security reasons, but it's actually because those are Muslim majority countries, that is, it, you could call that indirect discrimination on the basis of religion or something, but it's perfectly direct in the sense of uh, it satisfies the definition I gave. It's just the dimension of treatment has to be specified. Sorry for shaking that all around. The, uh, the dimension of treatment has to be specified the right way, but if you do, it's clear that people are being treated differently uh, on the basis of their religion, even if the government isn't transparent about the fact that that's happening. So I don't think we need sort of a special concept, a special extended concept of discrimination to accommodate that. Second kind of case is uh, what's sometimes called selective indifference. So if you imagine a firm that has you know, a very ungenerous um, parental leave policy, and that's very bad for women uh, in particular, but it doesn't differentiate on the basis of sex or gender in the policy. Um, that might not be a pretext for discrimination against women, but it might also be the case that um, the firm is selectively indifferent to the interests of women, let's say in professional advancement, and that if it weren't, it wouldn't have this policy. And in that kind of case, again, you could call it indirect discrimination on the basis of sex or gender, but it's direct in the sense it satisfies the definition I gave because um, uh, people are being treated differently in the dimension of how their interests are weighed in the formulation of the policy. And they're being treated differently in that dimension because of their being regarded as women as opposed to men. So it seems to me, again, that's a kind of case that um, you don't, need to go beyond kind of the conceptual core to capture. But there are cases that my analysis doesn't count as uh, discrimination, which are cases of a policy that you know, isn't a pretext, doesn't arise from selective indifference uh, or anything like it, but just has a disparate impact on people who are members of particular groups. Um, and it's often, uh, in the literature, people distinguish between sort of two kinds of situations where that uh, arises. One is where the disparity in impact um, is itself causally due to some prior injustice or discrimination on the basis of that same um, uh, uh, trait. So for example, some of the early 
disparate impact uh, cases in the United States and under discrimination laws were about employment tests, standardized tests that uh, black people uh, did less well on than white people on average. Uh, and that resulted in their being disproportionately excluded from the relevant job opportunities. And that's a case where maybe it's the test isn't a pretext for you know, trying to keep black people out. Maybe we could suppose the use of the test isn't due to selective indifference to the interests of black people. We could just stipulate that for purposes of the analysis. Um, but it's clear what's going on there, which is um, uh, the black candidates are on average less able to achieve well on the tests because of systematic widespread uh, discrimination in the allocation of access to educational opportunities that was itself um, uh, obviously race discrimination. So that's a kind of disparate impact structure that's common where you have uh, direct straightforward discrimination on the basis of an attribute. And then you have policies that don't differentiate on the basis of that attribute but have disparate impacts connected to that attribute because of the um, you know, downstream consequences of the prior iteration of discrimination. So that's sometimes called indirect discrimination. Uh, and then you have the, this sort of last category where um, there's no such causal story to be told, right? So like my uh, roller coaster example of the kid who can't go on the ride, the, the height requirement has a, <clears throat> excuse me, height requirement has an age-based disparate impact but that's not because of, uh, you know, the link between height and age is not due to some prior instance of discrimination. It's just their disparate impact. Or more in the real world, um, there have been cases in the US of disparate impact litigation about height requirements at um, uh, prisons, for example, for prison guards, which have a sex-based disparate impact. They disproportionately exclude women who don't satisfy the height requirement as often as men do. But it's, uh, I think, hard to say that uh, women satisfy the height requirement less often than men do because of some prior discrimination on the basis of sex or gender uh, toward women. That's not, as I understand it, why women are on average shorter than men uh, it, uh, or why female people are on average shorter than male people. Um, it's because of anatomical differences that are sort of not socially dependent or constructed maybe. So, uh, so that's a set of different kinds of scenarios that I think, whether you buy my analysis or not, they're sort of helpful distinctions to um, have in view when you're thinking about uh, discrimination. And mapping my analysis onto these, uh, as I said, sort of one and two, we can count as discrimination, but uh, three is genuinely something different. And it's something that um, I think is often wrongful and that ought to be legally uh, regulated, often prohibited, um, but that isn't itself discrimination on the basis of the uh, trait, right? So, you know, the prison that uh, excludes a woman who fails to meet a height requirement on this view um, uh, might be contributing wrongfully to um, occupational segregation in the society in a way that ought to be prohibited, um, but isn't usefully said to be um, discriminating on the basis of gender by applying this height rule. If in fact, uh, there's nothing in the genesis of the rule that's um, gender related, which of course might or might not be true. Uh, okay, so that's the way in which the analysis I'm offering you is sort of is narrow, but there are these other cases that might be understood in other ways and which some people in contrast to me would say, are, um, are, you know, usefully thought of as instances of discrimination. Uh, so I'm just going to go briefly through some theories of like, why is discrimination, however one understands it, uh, wrong? And of course, there are many ideas about this, um, but I'll give you a, a few uh, familiar accounts. So one family is uh, uh, points to the disrespect shown by the discriminatory act, and you can understand that in a couple different ways. One way of understanding it is in terms of the attitude manifested by the agent, you know, the um, failure expressed uh, or manifested in the act uh, to uh, 
recognize the equal moral worth, let's say, of those who are disfavored or the, um, as Kristen was saying, it gets a little complicated here because often it's put, and I've put it in terms of, you know, the full and equal personhood of those who are disfavored, but the animal context, you know, puts some pressure on that. But one way or another, sort of the, the attitude of disregard or disrespect uh, shown by the action, that that's really at the moral core of, of the concern. A different uh, idea that also gets grouped under this heading of disrespect is less focused on um, kind of the manifested dispositions or, or ways of responding to reasons of the agent and is more about um, the, uh, in, in some sense, objective uh, social meaning of the action or policy, um, that it, it, it has an expressive content um, that uh, demeans or, or expresses um, denigration toward a person or a class of people. So for example, um, uh, this is one of uh, Deborah Hellman's examples and she defends a version of this view that you know, telling um, uh, black students that they should sit in the back of a school bus in the United States uh, is wrongfully discriminatory, uh, even if you know, there's no, uh, nothing wrong with the attitudes that motivate it somehow, uh, because that kind of action just has a, almost like a quasi-linguistic meaning in our society of expressing inferior worth. And that's really the moral problem that we're focused on uh, when we're talking about wrongful discrimination. Second kind of view, and this I think is sort of the, uh, the closest to the lay view, the sort of common sense. Um, I mean, there is no one common sense view, but, but this is an intuition with I think a lot of um, uh, traction for people talking about discrimination in the real world, that something is wrongfully discriminatory because it's unfair or arbitrary, meaning whatever that trait P was in my definition, it's not actually relevant to the um, differential treatment that's being afforded. Um, it's not a reason why somebody is a better employee or is more deserving of this or that. And it's wrongfully discriminatory because um, you're therefore making an arbitrary, uh, unjustified, um, uh, unfair uh, differentiation between people. Um, and then the third would be, uh, you know, not unrelated, but would focus more on just the harm of these actions, either to individual people um, or at the social level. So, for example, I, I've defended the disrespect sort of ideas about um, what I think of as core cases of wrongful discrimination, but um, uh, those cases that some people think of as indirect discrimination, disparate impact, that I think of as not quite discrimination, I would want to tell a story about uh, the social harm of many of those actions in perpetuating certain patterns in um, the inequalities within a society in the labor market and elsewhere um, and say that those actions are wrong and ought to be prohibited on, on basically consequentialist grounds about uh, the harms they bring about rather than, as in some other cases, the attitude that they manifest, let's say. Or for that matter, on the ground that they're unfair. They might not be unfair and still give rise to um, uh, harmful social inequality. Okay, so that's some of the ways people think about wrongfulness. Um, so on the non-human animal side, I guess I have two uh, uh, broad thoughts I wanna uh, frame. So, so on the one hand, it seems obvious that mistreatment of non-human animals, I'm often just gonna say animals, um, uh, is species discrimination under the definition of discrimination that, that I'm giving you. And I think under, you know, I don't think that's idiosyncratic about my definition. I think that that's sort of on the non-moralized definition of discrimination seems pretty clear cut. Obviously these entities are being treated the way they are and differently than other entities are because of how they're, the species they're taken to belong to. That seems right. Um, but the question is, I think, whether that captures what is significant about uh, the mistreatment of non-human animals. Relatedly, whether speciesism, if it's understood as naming a kind of discrimination is really an apt way of thinking about this problem, either analytically or to some extent, I think this bleeds into thinking sort of uh, rhetorically in the same way Kristen was saying, um, uh, social movements have taken up this term and there's some feedback loop there. So, uh, so is this a useful way of thinking about this problem in, in, for any of those purposes, I suppose is the question. 
And I want to suggest some reasons why it might not be. Um, uh, and these really are questions and, and tentative. I'm not taking the view that, that it's not useful, but I think there are some reasons uh, to be worried about it. So I'll run through these and then um, spend a little more time on each of them. So one is <clears throat> in, in the cases that I take people concerned about this, including me, mainly to be concerned about like factory forming, experimentation and so on. Um, the problem is the treatment that uh, is being afforded to the entities, not the ground on which it's being uh, allocated to them. It's not the differentiation uh, uh, that matters. It's the thing that's happening to them. That's the first thought. In which case the discrimination part is kind of uh, potentially a distraction. Second and, re and related is that the value of equality per se may not be at stake here and may really be essential to the distinctive normative contribution that thinking about discrimination has to offer. Uh, and then the third is that to the extent that this is, as I'll suggest, sort of an, a kind of persuasive definition, which I'll explain, sort of like the effort to take indirect discrimination and, and dub it a kind of discrimination. Um, there are reasons to think that that can be problematic too, that that might not work or that it might even backfire. And, and some of the earlier uh, conversations about discrimination are sort of some food for thought about that. So, uh, I, and I'm gonna focus in the next few minutes on discrimination between non-human animals and humans. But again, as Kristen said, I think there's a separate and interesting question about the differential treatment of, you know, these animals are for pets and these we just eat, torture and eat. Um, and, and that's interesting and important too. And I'm gonna circle back to that at the end. First, I did wanna show you this video that I think sort of frames this in an interesting way. It's just a minute um, uh, and it's from PETA. Um, and I'll say a little bit about it after, but I'll play it now. I think that's interesting. I mean, uh, it tees up this question well, because there are things that seem uh, highly um, uh, compelling and appealing about it. And clearly they have made a judgment that um, this is rhetorically effective. And on the other hand, there are aspects of it that sound really um, uh, far-fetched. The idea that there just are no relevant differences between a mouse and a human being. And that uh, uh, the fundamental moral issue associated with uh, discrimination on the basis of race and sexual orientation and sex is really just the same thing that we're seeing uh, with respect to non-human animals. So in a sense, I'm interested, I guess, in the question of whether that's right or to what extent, which of the many claims that are sort of run together in that uh, minute are plausible and which ones um, aren't. Uh, so, so here's a, the first of these questions or challenges. As I said, it seems really clear that this is discrimination on the basis of species. By this, I'm gonna mean broadly, let's say factory farming, something like that. Um, it satisfies the definition. I think that's pretty straightforward. Um, uh, slaughtering creatures for food is species-based discrimination. But, but that may have little to do with what, what seems wrong about it to us, right? Um, to say that factory farming involves wrongful species discrimination kind of seems like saying that chattel slavery in the United States involved wrongful race discrimination, which it certainly did, but the wrong is the slavery, not the discrimination. It seems like if you, uh, and this is a fanciful hypothetical and I'm not saying it is remotely what happened or possible, but if people were allocated to the role of slave and master in a random way, so there's no discrimination involved on the basis of race, um, much, maybe all of the uh, uh, depravity and uh, moral um, uh, the grounds for condemnation might be exactly the same. So uh, it, and, and it seems to me so too with, let's say factory farming, that uh, this is just a role that should not exist. It's not necessarily the problem that um, if you think in terms of that explanatory condition that's essential to discrimination, it doesn't seem like the problem is we're allocating people to this role in a in an inappropriate way. Um, it seems like uh, it's just something that, in absolute terms, there's a wrong that should should be extinguished. That's a thought, at least. I think a response to that would be 
Well, in both of these cases, the slavery case and the um, factory farming case, the absolute mistreatment that I'm describing wouldn't happen, but for the ascription of inferior worth to um, the affected uh, people, or in the other case, um, animals, which is a kind of discrimination, right? So uh, the linkage, to the reason discrimination is apt here, it's not that the wrong at the end of the day is discrimination, but that discrimination in our allocation of uh, sort of moral worth is essential to the practices continuing or something. And I, I think that that seems right to me, um, uh, but I think you can say sort of the same thing I just said again, which is it's not clear that the discriminatory ascription of inferior worth is what's morally significant. You know, like um, uh, that, that some, if you think again, in terms of that comparison between you know, somebody X treating Y one way and some actual or counterfactual Z some other way. It's not clear that like the relative treatment uh, matters here or that it's um, the fact that some are being treated as inferior is what matters. Uh, you could understand what matters as just being the treatment of some people or creatures that are of moral worth as worthless or as of too little worth, that it's the inaccuracy not the disparity relative to somebody else or some comparator that is the moral problem. Even if we're thinking in terms of moral worth rather than the ultimate um, treatment. And if so, then discrimination, which sort of seems fundamentally about discriminating, you know, uh, differentiation might be sort of the wrong lens to bring to bear to try to understand the, the moral issue there. Okay, that's one uh, line of thought or question related line of thought is that maybe the issue here isn't really about the value of equality. So perhaps discrimination adds something useful when inequality is a, a real moral concern because it identifies, and if you're using it in a, in a moralized way, condemns certain inequalities of treatment, the differentiation I was just talking about. Um, I think rhetorically discrimination, um, at least in the United States, has become especially associated, as I was saying earlier, with sort of arbitrary non-meritocratic differential treatment, right? It's like you're, you're discriminating in the sense that you're treating people uh, 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 better and worse for no good reason, That's a reason that doesn't track the merits. Um, but it's not clear that those values, you know, inequality in a robust sense, or even this kind of thin notion of arbitrariness uh, really are doing any work here. Uh, and a few reasons for thinking that in addition to what I've said already. Uh, one is that, uh, and this is not an area I'm an expert in, but I think it's safe to say most non-human animals are not even capable in principle of consciousness of their relative treatment, of feeling demeaned, right? So if you think about um, Hellman's example of um, telling black kids to sit in the back of the bus, the, the thing that our moral intuition is locking onto there um, even if the students don't feel it in a particular instance, they're at least capable in principle of feeling uh, insulted by that, demeaned, made to feel inferior. That's what this idea of demeaning is all about. And I, I, it, that may not even make sense as applied to, certainly doesn't make sense as applied to many of uh, uh, you know, the animals uh, who are mistreated by humans. It may make sense in some form as to some of them, um, but maybe not the same form. And I think more importantly, um, it would have a pretty limited application. And yet it seems pretty central to at least the, some of the sort of disrespect-based accounts of uh, the importance of treating things as equals. Um, relatedly, uh, uh, it's not just that they may not feel demeaned, they also, I think, lack the kind of identification with the group that, that makes for status hierarchies in a society, right? So um, uh, one reason why discrimination against individual people on the basis of race or sex, or if you think about a hate crime and why are hate crimes treated the way they are, it has something to do with the affront, the injury to the whole class of people that results from um, the assault on a particular person. Um, because of the common investment that the people have in this social identity. And again, non-human animals, I think for the most part, it's safe to say, don't have a kind of identification with the species 
that um, that would make that kind of thinking make sense, or at least seems like an interesting question. Um, how theories that take that to be important in the context of understanding wrongful discrimination would or wouldn't map onto uh, animals that just have a fundamentally different psychology. And then the third and, and maybe the most um, aggressive sort of form of the point would be that um, in, in terms of that appeal to arbitrariness and, and meritocracy, you know, um, uh, discrimination talk does the good that it does often uh, because of a presumption that differentiation on the relevant ground is arbitrary that race and gender and so on we've learned are not um, uh, relevant bases of differential treatment. But when you extend the um, argument to non-human animals, that premise may not, I mean, seems like probably does not uh, work in many applications that uh, a disparity in the things that differentiate many non-human animals from many persons, humans, are exactly the kinds of things that one would think might ground um, uh, non-arbitrary differential treatment. And of course, even um, advocates of animal liberation, um, including Singer, acknowledge that from the beginning, you know, that of course, what it would mean to treat animals um, uh, in a non-discriminatory way would be uh, to treat them very differently than people are treated. And once you've made that step, it may be that much of the uh, force of appealing to discrimination, which at least rhetorically seems to trade on um, uh, a kind of uh, uh, objection to treating differently things that are actually the same, uh, maybe loses much of its force. Third and last of these points um, uh, is about persuasive definition. So I think what I've said so far sort of suggests that the appeal to, to think of maltreatment of non-human animals in terms of discrimination it's sort of a cousin of, or maybe an instance of uh, uh, this phenomenon of persuasive definition, which Jeremy Waldron wrote about long ago in connection with indirect discrimination, those disparate impact kind of cases. And he said, what's happening there is by altering the descriptive meaning of a word, one seeks to transfer the force of its emotive meaning to a new range of actions or situations, right? So uh, uh, a case of very disparate impact the thought is, isn't really discrimination in the way that people, at least at the time, ordinarily would think or talk of discrimination, but calling it indirect discrimination is a, is a way of kind of trying to transfer the normative charge that is associated with discrimination proper to this other set of conduct. And that you know, might be an effective, valuable thing um, to do. And it might be, and I sort of get the sense that maybe that's what's happening here too, and in the appeal to think of these things as the, the issues involving non-human animals as discrimination, sort of um, uh, an effort to transfer the normative charge that we have, the, the, the emotive meaning as Waldron says, um, uh, to this other situation. And uh, there's some appeal to that for sure. So that's what Singer's expanding circle idea I think was about sort of, uh, uh, and, and Kristen framed this well too, this idea of you know, um, what's so different about this, you know, it, it seems uh, like just as we've expanded our circle of moral consideration in the past, this is sort of the next step. But um, persuasive definition doesn't always work and it won't work if uh, the things actually aren't relevantly similar or don't seem relevantly similar to the people whom you're trying to persuade. And I, I've suggested some reasons for thinking that that might be the case here. Uh, which is also to say sort of that PETA video may be kind of overreaching in, in its claims about the similarities here. And then I think additionally, uh, uh, there are real downsides to trying to do this uh, if it doesn't work well. So I think this is something that civil rights lawyers have seen with uh, the expanding definitions of discrimination that precisely because discrimination actually still does have this powerful association with uh, intent, you know, people think of it as something you do intentionally. They think of it as something that's blameworthy. They think of it as um, a kind of departure from meritocracy in the way I was describing, because it's kind of hard to wring those associations out of the concept. Uh, the effort to describe, let's say, a case of bare disparate impact uh, as discriminatory can just ring false to people, to juries, to, I mean, it just, um, uh, it's, um, 
it's a mixed blessing, I suppose I'm saying, or a double-edged sword. It doesn't um, uh, uh, necessarily, uh, uh, if you can't get the associations that don't apply to the new situation out of it, then you just have a description of the new situation that seems like a bad indictment of the new situation. Um, and at the same time, insisting on calling it discrimination can actually obscure other normative concepts that do cover those cases and actually would do the work that you're looking for, right? So um, uh, again, I'm going back to these disparate impact cases. It seems to me the way to think about them is not that they're discrimination, but that they're really bad for other reasons. Because let's say, even though you're not discriminating on the basis of sex, and I grant you that, you are doing something that contributes to sustaining a certain pattern in the social structure that is very harmful to lots of people and unjust in various ways. And we could call that oppression, we could call that subordination, but the effort to um, shoehorn it into uh, discrimination seems to me potentially counterproductive. And so in this sort of early stage of, uh, at least of my own thinking about the speciesism question, I'm sort of wondering if this isn't maybe a version of the same uh, problem. All that said, uh, I think there is this interesting question about, I've been talking about humans versus non-humans, but there is an, a different interesting question about differentiation between animal species. Uh, uh, and here's another thing from PETA on their end speciesism uh, website. They make actually kind of a big point of this. They say, uh, Peter Singer defined speciesism the way that Kristen said, a prejudice in favor of one's own species. But they say it's also speciesist to treat one animal's life as more valuable than another. And they point to the example of animal shelters, you know, that hold fundraisers to, to help dogs and cats by serving up the flesh of cows, pigs, or chickens. Um, uh, so uh, it's interesting to me that that form of thinking about speciesism has also kind of penetrated the, um, the world of social movement and ad movements and advocacy. Uh, and it does seem to me different in terms of the utility and potential uh, philosophical merit of the appeal to discrimination, because there is a way in which that much better fits the paradigm that I was describing of sort of arbitrary differentiation based on, um, you know, a culturally ascribed meaning that lacks any real intrinsic significance, right? That's, that's kind of a lay paradigm of race discrimination, let's say, is you're treating people differently for a reason that's based on what we culturally uh, uh, you know, put on the situation, but doesn't actually map anything that's really different. And that might capture well what's going on with the differential treatment of you know, a dog as opposed to a pig. Um, uh, and if so, um, the, the discrimination analogy seems to me to have more force there. It still doesn't seem to me like, uh, to the first point I made, it doesn't really seem like the real problem is with, with how pigs are treated is that they're being treated worse than dogs. That seems kind of irrelevant. It seems like it'd be the same problem even if there were no dogs. Um, but I can see the, um, the appeal of that at least as a rhetorical strategy and it, and it sort of, it seems like it has a little more analytic uh, merit to it too. Okay, so a very tentative uh, conclusion to this. Uh, as Christian said, Singer popularized speciesism speciesism with this extended analogy to racism and sexism. I think those ideas in recent years have increasingly become decoupled from discrimination actually, and, and for good reasons, because patterns of subordination and oppression don't actually have to operate mainly through acts of P-based differential treatment in the sense that the conceptual analysis of discrimination that I gave you is uh, homing in on. Um, let alone patterns of actions like that that are intentional and arbitrary in the way that sort of popular imagination uh, supposes. And so it's very limiting if we think of racism and sexism only as about race discrimination and sex discrimination. And I think that uh, is part of the insight reflected in the move to, to construe those isms more broadly. And in a way I'm suggesting there, there may be good reasons for making a similar divorce or at least separation um, uh, between speciesism and discrimination um, too. And uh, that's it, thanks.